So if you're expecting me to talk about cars, I'm sorry. <laughs> the auto here means yourself. Yourself. Slightly more complicated than a car. I have a book by a man called Emile Coué. It's called Self Mastery Through Conscious Auto Suggestion. Uh, inspired and helped crystallize a lot of ideas for me when I was writing a play called An Oak Tree. Uh, this, this is my copy. The book was first published in 1922. This is a 1932 English language edition. The book is still in print today. This is Emile here on the front. Emile Coué was a French psychologist and pharmacist who introduced a system of self-improvement based on auto-suggestion. He was the author of the mantra, every day in every way, I'm getting better and better. He facilitated the healing of the sick by getting them to think that they were well. He never claimed he cured them, but that they cured themselves. On the title page of this book are the words, Our actions spring not from our will, but from our imagination. The book contains lots of testimonials from people who claim to have been cured by Monsieur Coué's method. Coué talks about the imagination, he talks about the will. He says there is an absolute rule that admits no exception. The will always yields to the imagination. He writes about the conscious self and the subconscious self. The subconscious self is where the imagination resides. If we can control the subconscious, he says, then we can release the influence of the imagination on the moral and physical being of mankind. He was always very modest in his claims. <laughs> There's no materiality to Kuei's practice, no surgical or pharmaceutical interventions. There is only a set of conceptual suppositions that in turn have a material consequence. In Kuei's case, the consequence is better health. He says, every one of our thoughts, good or bad, becomes concrete, materializes, becomes, in short, a reality. The lever for this process of transformation from thought into matter is the suggestion. Kuei defines the suggestion as the act of imposing an idea on the brain of another. Uh, here's an example of a suggestion uh, becoming reality. Uh, it's the epigraph to Timberlake Wharton Baker's play, Our Country's Good. Uh, it's a quote from a 1968 book called Pygmalion in the Classroom by Robert Rosenthal and Lenore Jacobson. 20% of the children in a certain elementary school were reported to their teachers as showing unusual potential for intellectual growth. The names of these 20% of the children were drawn out of a hat. Eight months later, these unusual or magic children showed significantly greater gains in IQ than did the remaining children who had not been singled out for the teacher's attention. The change in the teacher's expectations regarding the intellectual performance of these allegedly special children had led to an actual change in the intellectual performance of this randomly selected group who were also described as more interesting, as showing greater intellectual curiosity and as happier. So the, teacher, the teachers were given the suggestion that these children had unusual potential. The children received the suggestion that they had unusual potential. A suggestion is conscious. It's an act of will demonstrated by how we act or what we say. With an auto-suggestion, however, Kuei defines it as the act of implanting an idea in oneself by oneself. An auto-suggestion is subconscious. It's an act of the imagination. It's an auto-suggestion that will enable the child to finally recognize their suggested potential. We teach through suggestion, and we learn through auto-suggestion. Um, the first play that I wrote was a play called My Arm. And it's, uh, it's an autobiographical piece about me living with one arm above my head until I die. Uh, it's told very simply in the first person like I'm talking to you now. At no point in the telling of that story do I ever actually raise my arm above my head. A couple of years ago, I met a woman who had seen me perform the play a few years before, and she'd had a question that she always wanted to ask me. Uh, didn't it hurt, she asked. 
you having your arm above your head during the show, didn't that hurt? In the history of that show, I have never raised my arm above my head. In performance, I suggest that that's my situation. But it was this woman's subconscious who had authored an auto-suggestion that I'd actually done so, that I physically did, that she had seen it. As Kuei insists, the will always yields to the imagination. The subconscious is stronger than the conscious. It can rewrite what we're shown. As artists, I think we need to consider the subconscious, or at least play to its ability to see things that aren't there. I don't mean hallucinations or optical illusions, but I, I mean seeing things not with the eye, I suppose, not with the, the retina, but seeing things in here, in the mind. The stuff that uh, the artist Marcel Duchamp described as anti-retinal. Anti-retinal art, co-authored between the artist and the audience's mind. Let's make art that is at the service of the mind. The stuff seen in here lasts longer, maybe. Certainly has a more profound effect. This is the site of theater. What happens on stage is secondary uh, to what happens in here, I think. No amount of forceful imposition of the will, of a suggestion, can achieve a result without the subject's subconscious being ready to receive it. Uh, I can stand on stage and tell you that I'm Hamlet. I can be dressed like a moody prince. Uh, the stage can be made to look like a castle, but unless your subconscious receives my suggestion and authors a corresponding auto-suggestion, then I'm just a man in a room wearing someone else's clothes and talking someone else's lines. The active principle of artistic transformation resides in us, the audience, and not them, the performer. Much attention is paid to helping an audience connect with its subconscious. Theatres are designed to make us as unaware of our physical selves as possible. We're placed in the dark, in comfortable conditions, focused away from our fellow audience members. But I think the process is more robust than that. I think the leap between conscious to subconscious, from suggestion to auto-suggestion, is much more effortlessly achieved, and often with the most simple of requests, the most obvious of contracts. Think of a storyteller. Think how little they need. Talk of the subconscious can make it sound like some kind of mystical experience, but I think it's all very matter-of-fact. Maybe we overcomplicate things by talking about belief in the theatre, a believable character, the suspension of disbelief. I never ask you to believe that my arm is above my head. Kuei doesn't use the word belief. He doesn't write that we should believe in the suggestion. He writes about thoughts and about thinking. Our thoughts become actions. A thought is enough to effect a transformation, to author an auto-suggestion. If we think this thing, then it is so. In Shakespeare's Henry V, the prologue says, Think when we talk of horses that you see them, printing their proud hooves in the receiving earth. Shakespeare respects our imagination and awards it with the task of seeing things that are not shown. Think when we talk of horses, not believe. Peace out our imperfections with your thoughts, the prologue says. I hope Shakespeare is being falsely modest when he talks about imperfections. If by imperfections he's apologizing for not having had the budget to get real horses, then we're all screwed. A real horse doesn't allow for an auto-suggestion. A real horse is a real horse. Our subconscious is bashed over the head with a real horse. Let the imagination in. Think of a horse and our sub subconscious goes to work. Theatre can sometimes overwhelm our hungry, fertile imaginations by not giving them enough to do, which is another way of saying by doing everything for them. The play I mentioned earlier, uh, An Oak Tree, the play that was in part inspired by Emile Kuei, has two actors in it. I'm one of them, and the second actor is different every time the play is performed. They walk on stage at the beginning, and they've never seen or read the play. They can be any adult age, any gender, color, shape, size, anything. They wear their own clothes. 
An oak tree gives them all the same character to play, a grieving father named Andy. At the beginning of that play, I describe the character to the second actor. You're 46 years old, I say. You're, you're six foot two. Your lips are cracked. Your fingernails are dirty. You're wearing a crumpled Gore-Tex jacket. Your trousers are muddy. Your shoes are muddy. You have tremors. You're unshaven. Your hair is graying. And you have a bloodshot eye. This is the suggestion. It's received by the audience and the character appears. It appears in the form of the second actor, the actor who doesn't know the play, the actor of any adult age, any gender, color, shape, size, etc. The character appears, but not through the retina. The auto-suggestion is made. Think when I talk of this man that you see him. Theatre is predicated on processes of suggestion and auto-suggestion, of imposing an idea in the brain of another, and then that idea in turn becoming part of self, auto. Kue again. If the imagination and the will are ever in conflict, the imagination will always win. The artist's work can only ever be a suggestion. Yeah, a note, a line, a gesture, um, uh, an alteration to the everyday, a story. But that suggestion only becomes an art principle when it is engaged in as an auto-suggestion in the mind of the audience. Art does not exist without an audience. Uh, Marcel Duchamp again. The creative act is not performed by the artist alone. As a side note, I'd like to, um, I'd like to advocate a, an, a school of audience. Yeah, or rather, in this uh, Royal Conservatoire, suggest that the first term of every course should be spent just being a receiver. Just understanding the receiver's contribution to the creative act. And understanding that every work that we make in this place is made in the shadow of the audience's stronger existence. The process of transference from conscious to subconscious happens all the time. It needs no uh, trigger. Kuwe describes the, the, the auto-suggestion as uh, an instrument that we are born with and which we play with unconsciously all our life, like a baby plays with a rattle. Our minds are conditioned to impose an idea in themselves, by themselves. They're hungry for it. They need no prompting. If anything, it's the, ob it's the opposite. The more effort we put into the suggestion, then maybe the harder it is for the receiver to make it part of self. We pack the creative act with material, with crazy adult notions around technique and training and specialism and illusion and authenticity and talent and virtuosity and capital and sadly fame and celebrity. These only seem to tilt the playing field away from the audience. Kuei says that uh, auto-suggestion is nothing but hypnotism. Hypnotism. When we think about hypnotism in the discourse of art, then things start to happen for me. Uh, in that play, An Oak Tree, the character that I play is a stage hypnotist. Crudely, this is how hypnotism works. Uh, the conscious self, the will, is distracted by some means or other, a swinging watch or a physical or mental activity or an alteration to the everyday. While the conscious uh, mind is distracted, the hypnotist can access the subconscious, the imagination. Once the subconscious is uh, addressed, then anything is possible and no material support is needed. It's needed to, to transfer or affect that change. What Kuei says is, that an engaged imagination repudiates the will and dominates the conscious processes of the everyday. I studied when I was developing an oak tree one particular stage hypnotist, uh, and I used some of his techniques in uh, the early sequences of the play. So this is how it works. Uh, volunteers are called for from the audience, and then they are filtered uh, based on their levels of suggestibility. So suggestibility is tested uh, through very simple acts, uh, an imaginary weight being placed on the arm, or hands clamped together and then imagined to be inseparable. Once the hypnotist is working with people who are open and suggestible, then the subconscious can be addressed directly, simply, effortlessly, matter-of-factly. For example, um, the hypnotist says to the subject, uh, at a given signal, say, uh, you won't see my body, you'll just see my head floating uh, in space. Uh, the signal is given, and the subject leaps backwards in fear. This is anti-retinal art. 
The instructions are overt and obvious. Yeah, no sleight of hand, no trickery, no illusion, technique, training, authenticity, virtuosity, capital, celebrity, fame, blah, blah, blah. Just, just a receptivity, a suggestion, and an auto-suggestion. So what, what if we think that an audience, a theatre audience, is in a state of hypnosis? That uh, its subconscious is open and it really wants to do some work? How does that thought release us as theatre makers? How little do we need to make art? Thanks for listening.